everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Producers Roundtable Best Motion Picture presented by the Canadian Media Producers Association at the 2022 Members Lounge. My name is Mara Gour Mercado and I am the Executive Director at l'Académie Section Québec. Members Lounge 2020, wait, yeah, that's a lot of 20s. 2022 is presented by uh, Canadian Media Producers Association, which represents hundreds of Canada's independent producers. They are the people who make the shows and movies you love. Members Lounge 2022 is also made possible with the support of our programming partners, Director, Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario, William F. White International, Bell Fund, Le Fond Bell, Boat Rocker, Nabit 700M Unifor, Telfilm Canada, La Banque Nationale, Le Bureau du Cinéma et de la Télévision du Québec, The Independent Production Fund, Panavision, and Sodec. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please put them in the Q&A and we'll save some time for those at the end of the session. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel, all of whom have produced one of the five films nominated this year for Best Motion Picture at the Canadian Screen Awards. First, we have Garrett Patrick Pong, the producer of Wildhood, directed by Bretton Hannum and nominated for eight Canadian Screen Awards. An actor and turned producer and president of Rebel Road Films, he has also recently produced a short film, The Moho, which premiered at South by Southwest and won Best Live Action Short at Palm Springs Short Fest. Next is Luc Derry. Producer of Les Oiseaux Ivres, directed by Ivan Grabovich, and nominated for six Canadian Screen Awards. He is the founder of Microscope, and with his partner Kim McCraw, has produced over 25 features with directors such as Louis Archambault, Philippe Falardeau, and Denis Villeneuve. Shasha Nakai is the producer of Scarborough, which she co directed with Rich Williamson and is nominated for 11 Canadian Screen Awards. Her work has aired on the BBC. CBC, ZDF, and Arte. Screen at the Museum of Modern Art was named TIFF's Top 10 and shortlisted for an Oscar. Tara Woodbury is the producer of Night Raiders, directed by Dennis Goulet, and nominated for 11 Canadian Screen Awards. Tara also previously developed and ep the smash medical hit Transplant for CTV and NBC, and is Netflix Canada's first content executive. Yannick Letourneau is the producer of La Nuit des Rois, a Canadian co-production with France, Ivory Coast, and Senegal, directed by Philippe Lacote and nominated for two Canadian Screen Awards. Yannick is the owner and co-founder of Periferia, a film production company in Montreal dedicated to bringing director's stories to international audiences. And I will pass it off to our moderator for today's session, Claudia Hébert. Claudia is a radio host and culture reporter for Radio-Canada, she can be heard on various programs like Tout un matin, Culture Club, and On dira ce qu'on voudra. Thank you and welcome. Merci, Mara. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to my guests, my panelists today. I'd like to go around first and ask all of you how you got involved with your films and why you got involved with those films. Maybe we start with Garrett with Wildhood coming of age, a teenager looking for his mother, reconnecting with his roots, discovering his sexuality. Um, how did you get to meet with director Bretton Hannam and, and, and why did you want to carry this project with him? Um, well, the, my kind of philosophy uh, producing is first try to look at the filmmakers who, uh, who are your friends. And so I've been friends with Breton, uh, since I was 16, they were actually the first person to cast me in a short film in my past life as an actor. And so when I got into the CFC's Producers Lab in 2017, they were the first person that I reached out to see what they were working on. And they sent me this film. And I just immediately resonated with Link's journey of trying to find a parent you didn't know. I've never met my father. Um, and so as a kid, I would kind of, I remember so many nights falling asleep and imagining 
what uh, a journey like this could be like for, um, for myself. And so when I read Link's uh, journey, I just, I saw um, myself in a different way through this character and knew that it would resonate with uh, audiences on so many different levels. You know, it's a, like you say, it's a coming of age story. It's an identity drama. It's a road trip film. And at the heart of it is this rebellious character who I think uh, a lot of both indigenous and um, settler youth could identify with that kind of rebellious soul. And, um, and so I thought it was really important to support my, my friend uh, on this film. And it was also just a great opportunity for, for me to learn how to kind of take a film from development through to the, to the finish line. I didn't anticipate that we'd do it through a pandemic, but that, that was a great, you know, great, great learning experience as well. Luc Derry with Drunken Birds, Les Oiseaux Weaver. Um, the film is between a drug cartel in Mexico and then migrant workers on the farm in Quebec. How did you get involved on in that project with Ivan Garbovich? Sorry about that. We were actually big fans of uh, Ivan's first uh, feature film called Romeo Wolves, uh, which he'd made almost. 10 years ago. Good 10 years ago, yeah. A good 10 years ago. And uh, we have the chance of working with his wife, Sarah Mishara, a great DP with whom we worked on, uh, on I would say, five or six movies, a very talented DP. Uh, and we, so we got to know Yvonne through, uh, through Sarah. And uh, we actually started developing a future project with Sarah as a screenwriter and she and Ivan was involved in move in uh, in meetings because he was uh, going to direct it eventually but it was very much Sarah who was writing it and uh, to be quite frank the first few meetings with Ivan even though we liked this film a lot uh, uh, didn't go that well and he was very protect protective of his of his wife and uh, through the years of working with him and being involved with uh, with him on on Sarah's project, we got to uh, to tame him and to uh, you know get to know him better. And uh, um, at some point in time, I think he uh, felt at ease to you know pitch a project of his. Uh, Sarah's movie was actually uh, in difficult to develop and was like a, a, a really big movie that we didn't see necessarily, uh, you know, uh, getting it off the ground quite rapidly. Ivan had a script that he'd written a long time ago uh, and uh, he pitched it to us and we read it. It was already very close to what the movie is today. Uh, he had co-written it with, with Sarah but it was a it was a, it was it was his idea from uh, from the get go, and uh, we were just uh, completely uh, floored by the script. I would say it was uh, already very precise, even though it's a um, you know intertwining stories with uh, with back and forth in time, and and it's quite complex in in in, in structure uh, in the end in the movie, and it was ex not exactly, but it was very quite similar in the script and um, we just uh, loved it. It reminded us of the way we felt with my producing partner, Kim McCraw, who read it at the same time. And it reminded us in a way of the way we felt when we read Incendie, uh, a Denis Villeneuve movie that we produced about 10 years ago as well. And uh, we just fell in love with it. And um, uh, yeah, it, the, in terms of subject matter, it was also quite interesting to us. It felt timely. Uh, it was uh, ambitious in its scope. Uh, we liked the fact that it took place in rural Quebec, a little bit in Montreal, uh, but also in, in, in Mexico. 
Um, it it's interesting in because many projects are coming up now about migrant workers working on farms and you kind of opened the trend. <laughs> you, you came first before those yeah. other projects. There's there's a few actually one of the, uh, one one of the things Ivan showed us uh, uh, along the way is an NFB documentary that dates back from I think maybe seven or eight years ago about the subject uh, a short documentary that's actually uh, terrific as well hmm. and uh, let's hear uh, from uh, from Terra for uh, Night Raiders. It's a dystopian film in the future where children are taken away from their parents and it's in the future, but it reminds of us of reminds us of the past of their residential school for sure. Um, how did you get involved on on Denise Goulet first film? Yeah, Dennis and I had actually worked together on a short film called Awakening in uh, 2012, so long ago. Um, and I was story editing it with her, and really we really liked collaborating together. Um, and I was really blown away by her vision and um, her talent. So I approached her after we had worked on the short together and asked if she was interested in turning it into a feature. She went away and kind of came up with a different uh, concept, the, the dystopian concept you see, but still took a lot of that near world sci-fi elements that she'd explored in Awakening. Uh, a strong female protagonist, kind of playing with some tree concepts within her work. And um, we started developing Night Raiders together. And we, we worked on the script for four or five years with the support of the now defunct Harold Greenberg Fund, which supported so many tremendous films here. And it's incredibly sad that it's gone. But um, yeah, we just took our time working through the script and she worked with her father on some of the Cree concepts and the language to kind of help inform that story. And when we felt like we had a story that um, we were ready to share, then we started kind of bringing it out and going, okay, I think we have a film. So that was the, the origin of it. And now we go to Ivory Coast with Yannick Letourneau with Knights of King, La Nuit des Rois, Philippe Lacoste, it's his second feature film as a director. How did you get involved in this co-production with Ivory Coast, France, and, and Canada? Oh, and you, microphone. Yes, sorry. Voilà. And Senegal. It's also a co-pro with Senegal. Um, well, I've been involved uh, in working with the uh, African continent since uh, more than 20 years. Um, my mother lived in Burkina Faso in West Africa for some 10 years. And so I established a lot of relationship with the producer institution that do cinema. Uh, so I'm, uh, I've been close to everything that has been happening in terms of filmmaking. And I had seen the first film that was produced by Philippe Lacolte, Lacolte called Jassa Pris le Feu, which was at TIFF in 2012, I think. And I'd followed his career. I heard, I saw that he made run in 2014, that was in Cannes. And um, when I was there in 2017 in Cannes, uh, I was at an event and uh, I was with a friend of mine, Angel Diabang, who's a Senegalese producer. Uh, and she introduced me to Philip. and I had heard of his new project and I was fascinated by the subject matter. The way he was, that I had heard about it was more about the um, political crisis in 2010 that, that happened over there be, because of uh, electoral uh, fraud, uh, apparent fraud or whatever. And uh, so I was, I followed that very much. I was intrigued by what he wanted to do. And uh, so as soon as we started talking, we felt that, um, you know, he was usually uh, films from West Africa, the Francophone part, their first partner is always France. So there's rarely Canadian producers involved on uh, West African films. So he was uh, happy to have a Canadian that was interested in his project and happy that we would be able to bring a different way of doing things than the, the way they're used to, uh, either in West Africa or uh, France. So that was the, uh, the opportunity for us to bring like a very good DP, uh, Toby Marie Robitaille, uh, Hope Foglia, who's an amazing editor, um, Pierre Jurodet for the sound design, 
uh, Olivier, Olivier Larry who did the music and was a, one of our good collaborators. So it was for us the possibility of collaboration with you know technicians and a team from uh, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Canada, France to have this. It was just great. So that's how we we started, and that's why there was really a genuine interest. That, okay, if we work together, together we can really bring, really do something different here, and that's what we strive to do. And I'm very happy of how it turned out. Rightly so. Let's hear from uh, from Shashana Kai. So Scarborough, based on this book by Catherine Hernandez, portrait of three low income family in Scarborough, brought together through community. Uh, do you remember the first time you read the book, Shasha? I do. Um, so I had known um, Catherine for a long time, just through the Philippine X community, arts community in Toronto. Um, she was in my first student film 14 years ago. And then eight years ago, uh, Real Asian paired us together to work on a dance film. Um, and she really liked working with my partner, Rich and I. Um, when the book came out, she sent us a copy and said, um, you know, please give this a read. I have a bunch of production companies trying to option this, but I really want to work with you guys. And we were like, um, we don't have, we can't access this telefilm. Ten, we don't know, like we, we can't, we're documentary people. Um, and then, then she explained why and, you know, she really, really wanted to take a documentary style approach. This is her neighborhood. She didn't want giant trailers taking, you know, occupying all the sidewalks and tearing buildings down and putting things up. Um, you know, she didn't want a disruptive presence and um, she wanted it to feel like a documentary. And so um, we had conversations and we decided to work together on a adapting the book. And you're producing, you're also co-directing with your partner, Rich Williamson. How was that to have those two hats at the same time? Um, I firmly believe that you can be a director and a producer, maybe not both at the same time on the same set. Um, <laughs> the, the only way we were able to do this was because um, we had an associate producer, Kenya Jade Pinto, and um, she would often... Um, assist with you know swapping the, the producer hat when it was time to to re to direct and work with actors and stuff like that so um yeah we we all did a lot of roles but um i think a key part of being able to direct and produce was uh having kenya jade on the team can i ask the other panelists how how do you work with your directors what's the relationship and how involved are you in, in the creative decision and on the day-to-day making of the film. Maybe let's start with Luke, who uh, produced many films, who has many films on his uh, filmography. Um, it depends on uh, who you're working with and on what type of project and what's, what's the director's experience. Uh, we tend to be more, I would say, slightly more involved and a little bit more guiding with, with first-time directors and uh, uh, and as we, you know, build a relationship with with directors and 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 as their crafts uh, get, uh, uh, you know, better and better, at some point we are there mostly to support their vision. And obviously, if we rework with with people, it's because we we like their work and their vision and uh, ensure and and share a vision for the project uh, per se. But uh, yeah, it it. I would say it depends. How about you, Tara? Um, I think it just, I agree with Luke 100%. Like each project has its own needs, whether it's heavy in VFX or, um, you know, dealing with cross cultural uh, collaboration. But I think what's most important is that creative alignment from the beginning and really taking the time to understand. The director's vision and and making sure that you're able to hold and protect that throughout and if it is going to need to be compromised because of budget or weather or whatever that you're in lockstep in making those decisions so i think really giving that time off of the top to understand what's important to the director why it's important and so that you can be a truly helpful collaborator how did it go for you, Garrett? How involved were you on, on Wildhood? 
extremely involved um and that's uh that's a testament to uh brett's willingness to allow people into um that space with them um both kind of scripted projects that i've done i did a talent to watch web series uh that i co-created with the writer director um and then with wildhood i've just been fortunate to be in collaboration with artists who, again, just go, I go back to the fact that I'm working with um, friends first. And I think uh, a part of that friendship is built on mutual trust of taste. Um, and with both of those projects, and especially with Wildhood, um, Brett really trusted me to bring my experience as an actor in analyzing character um, to going deeper with uh, links, um, just with links, uh, not even journey. It was the the obstacles that links link faces and how he overcomes those obstacles. Um, just through my my work as a yeah analyzing scripts as an actor, I was just able to bring. Uh, a little bit of that to the development, and um, and I do look for for that willingness to collaborate in the projects that I take on. Um, I just think it's more fun, and I, you know, the the logistics part of producing is uh, is something that I'm good at, but it's not my favorite thing, and so I really want to I want there to be space for. Um, my creative voice to have some kind of impact on the story. Um, but the project that was just submitted to me that I'm now taking on, that's come in very developed. And so there, and it's equally exciting to me. Um, but I guess because I'm emerging uh, and I've, I've only done a few projects, it was it, it was interesting to me or it was a more it was more um, exciting to me to get projects where I could be a little bit more involved to um, build on that skill set. Um, and Yannick, with a co-production right away, you're more than one producer. How, how, how involved are you and how involved can you be? Well, it, it really depends on the projects. It depends on the type of co-production. Um, what was interesting in this case is that um, we came on board early in the process. So there was a, you know, a first or second draft, I don't remember, but you know, it was a, a good, good script on the table. And uh, we all read it and we exchanged with our partners in France and Philippe. And um, we, like that's where I like to be involved is, is everything leading up to the first day of principal photography. After that, I feel that I'm not the most useful person except to extinguish fires and take care of emergency administration and financial stuff. But before that, that to me, that's where the creative uh, input happens. And that's what I, I like to do. And it's it goes from the, you know, giving comments and notes on the script, trying to really make sure that we're all we're all on the same page and working towards the same vision and um, also to bring like different sensibility in terms of team like the dp the the editor like what's the right fit do they understand the world that we're you know so that that there is that connection and um so that's really important to me like finding the people is also a creative thing uh, because that that defines the 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 end product that you're going to deliver to the audience so, yeah, that's uh And we need to talk about the money, the financing of those films. Uh, maybe we can start start with uh, with Tara and and was it hard to finance Night Raiders? Was it a long process or did it come together fairly quickly? Um, well, our show is uh, international co production as well. It's a co production with New Zealand, so. Oh, and you have some big names uh, co-producing or executive producing. You have Teika Waititi, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, and that's an 
co-production split. So, um, and that came naturally because one of the key characters in the, the film is Maori and, um, and, you know, Dan has had a lot of relationships uh, in New Zealand as well. So um, that part is challenging. Like I, it was my first time doing an international co-production and I, I trying to make sure that both of the countries all the pieces and forms and all of that stuff really check out and the timing of each of those pieces works um, was far more complicated than I possibly could have anticipated. But on the Canadian side, um, I think because Harold Greenberg came in early um, and then Bell was quite interested and then so was CBC, we were able to bring on those broadcast licenses early and um, and then we had XYZ and Elevation also with a lot of enthusiasm early on. So on the Canadian pieces, we had a tremendous amount of support and enthusiasm and those partners really, really helped. How was it for you, Shasha? I know the, the book is beloved. It must have been a, a good calling card to, uh, to get meetings. Mm, not really. I mean, it's the nope. first feature. <laughs> it's the first feature. So, um, and it's a talent to watch project, right? So, um, telephone talent to watch didn't really doesn't really play with anything else, and I didn't really know that. Uh, so it was quite challenging um, at the time, especially because this was like the first iteration of the talent to watch program. It's changed many times um, and is now different this year. But um, yeah, so we had support from Telephone Canada for talent to watch. Uh, we got a teensy amount of support from the Toronto Arts Council, um, a teensy amount of support from the CFC Slate Fund, and we got a lot of in-kind support from our um, community partners. So that's like Scarborough Arts and Carrie's Place Autism Services, um, and a lot of loans and deferrals. <laughs> uh, that's how we made that film happen. How about you, Garrett? Um, I have to kind of echo Tara in that we really had a lot of support uh, from the Canadian system for this film. Part of, I think, why I was so excited about it being my first feature was that it was, we were financing it at, at a time when Telefilm had just launched the um, new Indigenous uh, feature film fund. And there unfortunately isn't really a precedent for um, indigenous films of this scale coming out of Nova Scotia and uh, for the Mi'kmaq community. Um, and so it being a coming of age story and an indigenous story set in Nova Scotia, um, it, it uh, it just met a need that had been underserved for a long time. And so our financing partners kind of, we were lucky in that the first applications that we made to Telefilm, CMF, Shaw Rocket, uh, were, all, were all accepted for basically the amounts that we had applied for. And really like, thank God for Shaw Rocket Fund. Um, because uh, because they filled a, a huge hole for us. And also Marinez Lenten, at C who was at CBC at the time, was just such a quarterback for this film. She gave us some development funding uh, in the last round of development of the script that really allowed us to do a huge casting search um, that had really never been done in Nova Scotia before. So. Uh, she, without her support, I, and without that license fee that was triggered at CBC, it really did a domino effect, and um, I'm extremely grateful to her for it. Luc, was it a, a quick financing of Les Oiseaux Ivres, or was it a slow process? Uh, it was actually a pretty quick financing. I think we may have had to apply a few times, but... Uh, it was very straightforward uh, with Telefilm and Sadak was on board quite early in the movie. We had a, a good distributor with uh, a decent MG that, uh, uh, you know, showed market uh, confidence in the movie. And uh, I guess with Yvonne's uh, 
the success of his first movie, our track record, uh, I have to say it, it wasn't, they're, they're always difficult, but it, it was, uh, it was, it, it went fine. And Yannick, with those different countries uh, collaborating on this project, how did you pull this stuff together? Um, it happened quite quickly, actually. And that was surprising because the experience that I had with um, projects related to Africa with the African cast are usually very difficult. There's a lot of prejudice against the uh, African films, unfortunately, in the market by distributors, uh, mostly, and sales agents. But we were able early on in the process with uh, us and our um, partner in France to secure Memento, Memento International for the sales agent. And uh, we secured Rimage, which is a European fund to which Canada contributes that we got uh, along with our partners. And we also secured the national funds in Ivory Coast, which was very uh, decent. And we managed to raise a budget of uh, close to 4 million, which uh, we're very proud of because it's, it's really difficult. Uh, usually um, for African cinema. So um, yeah, and uh, about 21% of that comes from Canada. And so you said earlier, you brought some, some crew with you and some parts of the film in post were done in Montreal, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Night of Kings, it, it's in a prison. There's this whole storytelling aspect. The guy has to tell a story whole night long if he wants to live literally. It's like a Sheherazad kind of story. Mm -hmm. um, but how is it to bring crew to Ivory Coast? It's not a country that produced a lot of cinema. How is it on the ground making the film for you and, and your team? Uh, it's, it's very difficult because there's not much infrastructure. Uh, just a, a small anecdote, just for the, the lights, we were quoted $500,000 <laughs> for the lights. So, it, you know, and it was like very old light. So we needed to bring like lamps, special digital lamps that work, that are very small, that work in a complicated environment uh, all the way from Canada. And we had somebody that was specialized to work with these types of lighting. And we had like crews from, you know, Senegal and Ivory Coast that, that knew how to work with the equipment they had over there available. So it was a mix of, you know, high tech, low tech, and we made it work. It was really a work of collaboration and, and the DP was detrimental because he was kind of a natural leader on the, on this production and, and everybody was behind him because he was uh, very humble and had a, had a vision for the film he wanted to preserve for the director. So it went well. Look, there's a part of film shot in, in, in Mexico. Is there, how was it to have this part of the film done abroad? Um, tell us about your experience. Um, it was actually a really, really terrific experience. I have to admit, we had an incredible partner over there. We worked with a company called Pimienta Films. Uh, they are the producers of Roma. They were, you know, on a on a on a roll, I would say, and so they 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 got us to be to to, to work with. Uh, a tremendous crew there, and uh, it 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 wasn't it wasn't possible to make a, an official corporal, but just getting them on board and them, uh, you know, also being a part of the, the 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 Mexican aspects of the of the movie just made it uh, so much better, and uh, it was a terrific experience uh, working over there. Garrett, I think you mentioned, you know, Nova Scotia does not have the biggest film um, scene in, on, of all of Canada. So was it a challenge to produce a film in the Atlantic provinces? Um, so just to be clear, Nova Scotia does have a great film scene. It, it was just in terms of uh, the history of having done indigenous films in Nova Scotia. And um, the experience was great, but it was, a huge challenge. Um, so we filmed, uh, we were one of the first films in Canada uh, once COVID uh, kind of took over to get into production, one of the first telefilm backed films anyway. Um, and that was because Nova Scotia in the summer of 2020 emerged to be kind of this COVID paradise uh, for a, a little while where there was so few case numbers um, that our financing partners and the bank 
felt safe for us to do this movie, which was mostly outside, um, for us to to do it. And you know, to when in those like early stages of COVID, when we were all figuring out protocols and whatnot, um, it's it's a it was a stressful uh, experience to to feel confident as a first feature film producer that I was gonna pull this off and that everyone was gonna be uh, safe while doing it. And so uh, also because, so because it emerged as one of the safest places, then a lot of film productions came there and scooped up all the crew. And so I had all these keys in place like many months in advance and then they all got poached one by one. And the, then we had to use, use crew that were um, less experienced. Um, and the, the, the hardest part about making the film was we lost our location manager on a road movie. And so I then became the location manager um, and the picture vehicle coordinator on a movie shot outside of Halifax um, in a remote location with many remote locations. And um, it just was all this responsibility that I didn't anticipate um, being kind of the, the quarterback for because it was a well-funded movie. Like it was, we were really lucky and to get a really great budget for it. And so I thought, okay, well, this is gonna be a great opportunity for me to really, um, kind of be by the monitor and like support Brett as much as possible. But uh, that uh, that I supported Brett in different ways and just in in order to kind of make our days and, and whatnot. But it was, uh, it's the hardest thing that I've ever done by tenfold. And I'll be honest, I never want to take on that much responsibility again on another film. I was like kind of a traumatic experience. Um, <laughs> I, I won't lie, it was. And, um, but thank God that we ended up with the material that we did and that we had some key partners like Guy Godfrey, our DP, who really helped um, share some of the load. Um, but but films that were shot during the pandemic, such a big part of the budget had to go to protection and, and masks and everything was slower. So it, it, it ate at the part of the budget. Um, Yannick, I think you shot before. It was all filmed before. And I hope so, because the prison is so dense, it would have been impossible. Yeah, we shot before, but we got uh, hit with the while uh, in post. And um, it made things more difficult because of the, the travel of the director, uh, because everything from the, the offline edit to the, um, the online, everything was done in Montreal. So it, it was complicated to deal at that point, but we managed to, we managed to it. And did everyone else shoot during the pandemic? How about you, Shasha, for Scarborough with the kids? Yeah, um, we, our film is shot 38 shoot days from August of 2019 to August of 2020. So our our final five shoot days were on, they were scheduled for March 15th of 2020. And uh, two days before our final block of filming, of course, the lockdown happened. So we had to cancel everything. And um, the children were growing very, very quickly. And we were just like, oh, maybe we'll just never finish the film or we'll have some bizarre ending. It's like five years in the future. Or um, <laughs> So for a while, we 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 just kind of let go and you know like everybody else we're in lockdown um but we started seeing productions go back in the summer and we started seeing how they were handling the protocols um and then we finished in august of 2020. how about you tara uh we finished shooting just before the pandemic um like yannick uh post was affected um in particular because we were supposed to be doing it in new zealand and i thought i was going to be in New Zealand doing a Lord of the Rings tour and having the greatest time of my life, but instead <laughs> was on my laptop at home trying to listen to our composer. So um, next, yeah, film. It, next film, next film, your next, tour. Yeah. yeah. Everything moving out is definitely going to be a New Zealand co-production, but um, 
yeah, so only our post was affected. Yeah. And Luke? We shot uh, most of it in 2019. Uh, we had a, a couple of days left. We were going to go shoot in China, actually, in January of 2020. And, uh, you know, we were that close to, to going. And uh, just a few weeks before Eva and Sarah were, 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 were going to go there, um, it just started to you know, unfold and we ended up shooting those two days in Montreal, shooting China, uh, shooting for China in Montreal. We were, it was a challenge. We were also some of the first, uh, some of the first uh, production to shoot under COVID in June of 2020. And it was quite stressful, quite, uh, quite complicated, just the unknown just not knowing, you know, what we were against, and and still there were a lot of mystery around the virus, and uh, so it was stressful. Uh, but uh, and then and then post just dragged on for almost a year instead of you know the five or six months that we were going to uh, to, to to have. It it was never ending. It was uh, it was a pain, but it was it was it was fine. It was okay. Let's keep talking about challenges that you encountered making the film. Um, let, let's talk about Scarborough. I know that working with kids can be a challenge. As you say, they grow up very fast. I guess you have to budget for time to improvise and to care for their feelings when the scenes are a bit intense. Was that part of the, the challenge of making Scarborough or was it something that went really well and the challenge was somewhere else? <laughs> Um, we had a lot of ridiculous things that happened. Um, I would say a lot of the challenges do stem from the fact that nobody was there. There wasn't enough of us and we weren't being paid enough and we didn't have enough resources. So we were all wearing many, many hats. Um, but, you know, I will say it, it was an added challenge to work with the kids because even though it was a non-union, completely non-union production, we still did the ACTRA guidelines for kids. And so we could never go over the eight hours. And then every like 40 minutes, we'd have to take a break. So even if we would be, you know, on a roll, it was like getting really good. We'd always have to be like, okay, so we have, the kids have to have their break. Um, and so um, that definitely added a layer of challenge, but I think, I don't think it was the most challenging thing that we dealt with. What was it? Uh, many things swirling together. <laughs> yes. Sarah, you have a, a film set in the future. It's ambitious. Was it part of the challenge to create that world? Um, well, Dan has always wanted the world to feel really kind of natural and like tactile. So the biggest kind of sci-fi elements, I guess, were the drones and the drone design. And even though she, like we literally built the drones so that you could kind of feel it within the film. Um, so that wasn't a big challenge. Uh, kind of two other challenges I can say is one, I'm from Winnipeg, Dennis is from Saskatchewan, and we really had intended this film to be shot in the prairies. We actually tried to set it up um, in Winnipeg and weren't able to do it and had to move provinces into Ontario and then re uh, relaunch it here, which was in, an incredible amount of labor and hand wringing. Um, so that was a huge challenge. And uh, on a personal level, um, we actually got news from Telefilm that um, we'd been approved two days after I'd given birth. And so I actually did the film with a newborn and just breastfed in the back of transpo vans and kind of pushed through because the timing was that. So on a personal level, um, it was a big challenge, <laughs> yeah. Look for drunken birds. Um, they are those gorgeous, beautiful shots uh, on the farm that are all at magic hour. But I can imagine that that gives you a very short period of time to film every day and you need light and you need to be very efficient. Is that stressful for a producer to know that you're going to have it an hour and a half window to film those cue scenes? Yeah, that was one of the main challenges. I would uh, I would say that the the both uh, both Sarah, well, I mean Ivan, 
is also a DP. Ivan, the director, is also a DP. So we were dealing with two quite gifted, quite ambitious uh, DPs, and we shot the film on, on 35 millimeter. And, and we, it was one of the reasons why we were so drawn to this project was that we felt it would uh, you know, be a real, uh, a real movie for for theaters and for cinemas, and uh, and that it would look amazing, which we still think it does. It uh, does. But it it made it quite complicated, and it was. Uh, and Ivan is a incredibly gifted director, but very ambitious and very um, how do you say? He he really wanted to make the most of every day. And uh, and some days, you know, it meant shooting at magic hour for forty five minutes, but you know, waiting with a full crew for uh, for a few hours before it was the right time to shoot. And it made for long days. And uh, and, and finding uh, the actors to be the the migrant uh, workers was that a challenge? It was also a very big challenge. Uh, it's there's uh, not so much uh, a, a big uh, Latin American community in in, in Montreal, uh, and we were quite, you know, in the end, quite lucky. We found some some of them are professionals, some are non professionals, but uh, they were all incredibly committed to the project, and uh, uh, it turns out, I think, quite. Uh, well in the end but it was it was a challenge finding those you know 12 15 guys uh that are not necessarily you know uh, that don't have that much to to say or do but are but are in so many shots yeah nick we, we covered part of the challenging aspect of knights of king but there's also the fact that you have this monstre sacré coming from France. You have Denis Lavant coming for a few scenes, and you have this very dense prison with so many characters. Um, tell us about all those aspects that just build on each other to make this film. Well, I think what was the most difficult for me was that, you know, it, it was a co-production, but uh, the, the production company in France uh, was um, was uh, the wife of Philippe Lacote, Delphine Jacquet, and Philippe was the director. So, and he was uh, he's the one who founded the co-founded the uh, Wasakara production in Ivory Coast. So that was and it was their first time. They were really not only co-producing between themselves; they were actually co-producing with somebody else. And uh, it was the first film of Delphine. So of course there was a lot of challenge in terms of like putting just understanding the dynamics of this complex co-production in four countries with multicultural crew. Um, so I think that was the, the biggest challenge how to, you know, and also it's not because you speak French as a Quebecer that we all speak the same French and things don't mean the same thing in France and in Quebec and in Ivory Coast and in Senegal. So <laughs> there was a lot of communication uh, needed. So we were all on the same page. I think that was the, the biggest challenge. Um, I'm going to ask Garrett, we, we, we talked about all those challenges for you, um, and that film, Wildhood, as those beautiful teenagers, two-spirit, finding each other, finding themselves, find, for one, finding his mother, um, and, and I think I'm going to ask this question to you and, and Tara as well. There's something quite precious about what the film is about. Um, did you feel that, that it was ex especially important to do it right was it there was there a, a little stress of we must do it and we must do it right big time absolutely there are so few two-spirit films that have been made that uh to get the opportunity to make a two-spirit Mi'kmaq film um was always I mean the, the reason why it was so important for us to film in 2020 was because we had spent um, like Shasha so much time in finding the cast and um, we were really conscious that if we didn't film this movie which had to be set in summer we'd waste a whole other year and they wouldn't be the same. They and, wouldn't be teenagers um, anymore. 
Exactly. And uh, so it was paramount that we film at that time. And I knew based on the cast that we had found that we had the possibility of uh, showing something really special in the chemistry of these boys um, and in this cast. So the entire time when it was kind of up in the air of whether this film was going to happen or not in 2020, um, one of the driving forces for me, for sure, was the fact that so few of these films have been made and we have to do it right. Um, not for not for even the Mi'kmaq community or the Two-Spirit community or it just for, for the next generation and to inspire um, youth across all communities who may identify as queer or indigenous or to see themselves for the first time on screen like this. And that's ultimately why I do what I do. How about you, Tara? And the, the film was released and there was the, the graves that were found all summer. So there was a timing issue too with your film that, that made it even more relevant, I guess, than when you first started working on it. Yeah, I mean, well, 150,000 approximately children were taken. Um, and so we had that history, of course, with us. So um, those graves existed and it wasn't new information that they existed, but yeah. certainly reckoning with them being um, excavated was a huge part of our processing around the release. But I would say, you know, when Danis and I decided to work together, we recognized we were working cross-culturally and I saw the immense responsibility she had to her own community along with the fact that she was a first time feature filmmaker on this journey. So she was carrying these two giant burdens and um, as, as generous as she was, I didn't want to put the burden of her having to also educate me constantly throughout. So I really endeavored to educate myself and take on that responsibility um, and, and do what I could to help shoulder that um, with her. Um, we, we did do a couple of things that really helped with that. One, we did use pathways and protocols in making the film and it, we brought in um, a consultant for kind of a half day training that was mandatory, mandatory for all crew and cast. And we went through pathways and protocols and also put the film in a historical context so that everyone working on the film could really understand uh, why it might be heavy for some of the actors and indigenous folk working on the film and help us hold that. And two, um, I had an amazing associate producer in Eva Thomas who um, came on early to the film and worked alongside me and then also built out an indigenous mentorship program um, that was uh, actually a mix of Maori and local indigenous uh, folk from Ontario who participated in the making of the film, gained experience, um, and it was just tremendously helpful to have such a large indigenous presence on the set. So um, we had many other you know, we had elders involved, we, we smudged and we had, um, you know, a lot of different kind of cultural protocols available throughout the filming. But I would say overall, um, Eva really helped me shoulder some of that and, and my other co-producer, Paul. I have someone in the conversation saying, go Eva. So yeah, <laughs> she's, uh, she's yeah. a wonderful producer. <laughs> I, I saw you nod along what Tara was saying. Um, were those questions you had on your set? How do we get to not have to constantly teach the crew about what we're trying to do and trying to say how to make sure that everyone's on the same page and not point, putting the burden on the director to educate people? Um, I would say that those conversations I mean, I definitely was aware of that um, going into production, but I will say that all of the crew were just so um, on board to make this really unique and special film for the area. And 
whenever we onboarded any of the crew, there was just such excitement to be a part of this special film. And so we, um, that never really was an issue for us to educate uh, any of the crew or that we needed to, um, to do that. I mean, yeah, I think everyone was just so aware that this was kind of a groundbreaking film for Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. uh, people watching us, don't hesitate to ask questions. There's a little Q&R, uh, Q&A, <laughs> mine is in French, Q&A um, button. You can just enter your questions. I have one already I'm going to ask right away. Um, at the beginning of the conversation, when I asked you all how you got involved on your projects, many of you said, oh, it's the director's a friend or we've been working together for a long time we've known each other for a long time so um the 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 question here is what about a newer emerging creators who doesn't have history relationships how do you get to be seen how do you get your production under radar let's ask the question first to look because you you've produced many films um how how have you sometimes i don't have your filmography under my eyes right now but um first time filmmakers how do they get on your radar uh usually with uh really good short 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 movies um we um are quite busy uh but approachable and uh um, i mean we're open to uh considering all sorts of uh, projects from uh from newcomers, but uh, I have to admit with the relationships we have with, you know, ongoing relationships with, with some, uh, with some directors. Uh, unfortunately, there's a little bit less room for, for those than, uh, than when we were starting out. But um, yeah, I mean, you have to, I think the more important thing is to have, uh, of course, a uh, uh, an accomplished uh, first project, but if you are going to come to us or to you know any producer with uh, with some type of a calling card, with uh, something that you know shows for your talent, that's probably the best way I think to uh, to start out. I'm asking the question to Yannick as well because I think Philippe is a Philippe Lacote who directed Night of Kings is a is an interesting case as well that he started producing films in Ivory Coast, then he made the first feature and you got to know him through festivals. So it's true. He kind of kind of made a room for himself and then you met him. Yes, but um, he was kind of in the circle of people uh, who, who are interested in African cinema. So I, I know a lot of people that we know in common and it was only a one degree of separation. So, you know, I felt like I, I knew him, although I didn't know him. You see what I mean? He's like part of this circle of friends and uh, colleagues. Don't hesitate to ask us questions. I will start to ask more of them uh, at this point. Um, we're talking about getting the film done. Let's talk about getting the film seen because, well, there's been a pandemic. Uh, festivals were online. Theaters shut down, then reopened, then re-shut down, then reopened. Now here we are. Um, how has it been a challenge? Uh, let, let's carry on with Yannick. I remember seeing Knights of King at TIFF online. Well, we did how, the premiere. Yeah. We did the premiere at the uh, Venice uh, and then at, at TIFF. And then we had several others. We did Sundance. We did uh, so many more than 80 uh, film festivals and, and the big ones and all to the smaller ones. So that was amazing. And after, right after the Venice screening, uh, we got a off few offers, but the most interesting one was from Neon in the US. So, um, and it was also the, the choice of our uh, sales agent. So we, uh, we went for Neon and that uh, I think changed, contributed to change the career of the film and really uh, pushed it out there, especially in the, it's weird because it's a Francophone film, but we definitely had more press and more interest in English language territories for some odd reason, which is very fascinating to me. And, um, and, and so, and the film ended up being on a lot of like uh, top 20 best film of the year from the BBC to Variety to Rolling Stone magazine. 
and then the, we, you know, there was the race for the Oscars and all that contributed to uh, generate interest. And that's the time when Neon decided to release the film in the US. So that was the first territory where the film was released. Unfortunately, most of the theaters were closed. Uh, the numbers, the biggest numbers we managed to open in Canada like a week or two after the US and the, the place in Canada in, in North America where we made the most money box, box office for the film was actually Montreal. So that was pretty amazing because it shows that there, there are real cinephiles in, in Quebec and in Montreal and that makes a difference for anything that is non English, non-US content. So and you it was said an that the, the race for the Oscars for Ivory Coast, and we have the race for the Oscars for Canada with Drunken Birds. Um, how did that impact the, the release of your film, uh, Luc? Um, it gave the movie uh, you know, sort of a different profile on the market, but I have to admit uh, that the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, it made it a lot more difficult for the film internationally than what we were expecting. Uh, we, um, we were going to maybe be in, 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 the, in a non-pandemic year, we would have been done with the movie probably sometime like in July or, or, or August of uh, 2020. So we had started, you know, uh talking to fall festivals fall of 2020 um and a lot of people a lot of festivals saw an early cut um and were quite interested in in the film in the in a bizarre year where they they a lot of movies weren't ready and we ended up so that i think they were looking for for movies and we uh eventually realized because of all these delays that we were, would not be ready in time for September. In fact, we finished the movie sometime, sometime, sometime in March of 2021, something like that. And 2021 was kind of the opposite. There were all these movies that got delayed and they were all coming you know, to the to festivals at the same time. And uh, festivals were still quite smaller in scope. Uh, all these festivals that usually show, you know, 200 or 250 movies were actually showing 50 or, or you know, 100. And um, it was, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a rough uh, road. We were quite happy, you know. We premiered the movie in the platform platform competition uh, uh, at TIFF. Um, but internationally, uh, it was a rougher road than what we envisioned. Getting selected as the Canadian uh, candidate for the Oscar race uh, enabled us to uh, get invited in several festivals. We ended up making a sale in the US, but to a very small distributor, to be quite frank. Uh, they're releasing the movie in the next few weeks. Um, but uh, again, it distributors around the world had all these movies on their shelves. Uh, they weren't shopping that much. And um, uh, I guess a smaller movie like ours, uh, uh, you know, didn't end up being uh, bought around the world as much as we would have hoped for. Night Raiders was a co-production Terra with, uh, with New Zealand. Was the film released there already? Uh, it just was released. Like Luke was saying, we were, you know, quite depressingly <laughs> impacted by COVID. And Luke, I just want to say that's such a shame because your film is so beautiful. Um, Thank you. And um, yeah, so we we sold to Goldwyn in the US and we're on Hulu right now. We had our international premiere at Berlin Al, which I watched through my phone while in my bedroom, the programmer walked me through the crowd. So that was Still thrilling. Still not going on that road trip in <laughs> Germany, of course. <laughs> I was not in, I, I maybe drank a German beer by myself. And um, <laughs> and then we, we had a gala presentation at TIFF, which was in person. And it was the first time we were able to be in person. Um, our cast came in and we truly got to celebrate, which was fantastic. Um, and almost a catharsis after going through this 
like everyone else, these elongated processes because of COVID. So it was our kind of one little group outing and then we all went back into our holes as COVID revived itself. So, yeah. Arbor always being released now, if not, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, so how was the process of releasing the film uh, for you, uh, Shasha? Um, yeah, I think we've just kind of tapered out. We have a couple more cities left, but it's still screening in Scarborough um, <laughs> right now. Um, uh, I learned a lot uh, through this process. I mean, I, we, we were kind of working in a vacuum, you know, in the pandemic. And um, I didn't really know that for fiction films, you're supposed to get a sales agent like immediately when you find out that you get into TIFF. <laughs> I was just like focused on finishing the film, to be honest, because we, we finished the film like right before TIFF. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we signed with Level, which has been wonderful. They've really been working closely with us and listening to our requests. Um, but we still don't have US or international distribution. Um, and that's kind of um, something I gather, you know, a lot of, uh, like, uh, like Luke mentioned, a lot of the distributors have backlog. We also don't have any stars. Um, additionally, um, during TIFF this year, not a lot of the US and international sales agents actually came here. So they didn't really actually get to hear the word of mouth buzz and actually get affirmation that this is a film that can do well with very diverse audiences around the world. Um, so yeah, we've yet to, we've yet to crack that challenge. So you say it's still screening in Scarborough. Was there some kind of community outreach to get the film seen by the people of Scarborough? Um, and it was really just me pestering John Bain at level and um, <laughs> saying, hey, did you book Scarborough yet? Did you book Scarborough yet? Um, because, you know, it's Cineplex and, you know, they, they believe in Marvel, the, the one true holy Marvel. Um, and <laughs> so uh, it just took some, you know, some convincing. Um, but uh, that was the best screening uh, we've had so far. And it was wonderful. We went there for the theatrical premiere um, and it's just up the street from where we filmed. So it was wonderful. And, and going back to Tara, is there some community outreach into indigenous communities with Night Raiders? Yeah, the um, Indigenous Screen Office and CMF both supported us. Um, and we actually have through the ISO, another community screening um, hap uh, three more happening this year. So it's been tremendous going into these indigenous communities and sharing the film. Their enthusiasm and curiosity has been really heartwarming. Yeah. Same question to Garrett. Is there a, a strategy to reach, to, to reach those communities with Wildhood? Um, yeah, uh, we're we're actually working on a strategy right now to um, bring the film to Mi'kmaq communities this summer. Can't talk too much about that yet. Um, but just to go back to the initial question, uh, it's been a roller coaster ride for uh, this film's reception. Um, it's it's really interesting to kind of be a first time producer in this time and and uh, kind of temper your expectations, I guess. Um, because I thought, uh, you know, we so we uh, we had the film in first look, this telephone first look that uh, enabled us to get the interest of Films Boutique, a sales agency, a fantastic sales agency out of Germany. Um, and so we were going into TIFF with that support. And then as Shasha said, then a lot of people didn't watch uh, a lot of the TIFF films. Um, and so that, that platform was a little bit muted. However, uh, the film's festival uh, reception has been fantastic. It's played at so many festivals across the world. Um, through its LGBT and um, kind of more traditional uh, circuits. And that's, I think, part of the strength of the film is that it really kind of boards those communities um, really well. And so it opened up um, festival platforms for us. Um, but, and the great thing about TIFF though too, is it, it really um, spurred the interest of basically every distributor in Canada because we went into the um, with 
into TIFF without a distributor locked. So that was great. Um, but uh, it's more so getting it to the actual audience uh, that's hard in box office terms that I, I can't, uh, I don't think anyone has the secret kind of success on how to get butts in seats right now. And so we've just kind of launched, uh, Mongrels launched it in Canada about three weeks ago. And, you know, the numbers are pretty shocking. And this film has had so much press. And I thought that that would lead to kind of great box office success, but it's tough. You like, like audiences are really comfortable in their homes and uh, watching stuff on streaming. And I don't know how we're going to fix that problem in the future, but I hope, I hope everyone kind of refines the love of seeing films in cinemas because it's, it's super important in, in terms of making money back for these films. And I just, and, and it's important for the communities that the film represents to be able to see themselves on a, a big screen, you know? Um, so I just don't wanna lose that. And uh, it's just been weird navigating this experience. So I have this big question asked by someone watching. Um, the question is, what are the biggest hurdles developing and funding films in Canada? What are the areas in the industry in terms of funding, creative, mentorship, talent that needs to be improved? Could it be distribution? I don't know. I'm asking Luc. I was kind of, I was kind of nodding. Very broad question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, the hurdles. Um, I'm not. I'm not too sure. I, the, what I can. What I can say about that is that uh, we're at a crossroads. I think uh, uh, right now, and uh, the 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 industry and the and the 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 environment is changing every six months. It seems like it's a little bit different in terms of you know what works and and where does it work and and. And where are people watching uh, movies? Except Netflix, of course. But uh, uh, the, the 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 so it's kind of difficult to, to 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 say. I'm not sure what to say. Maybe maybe what are what is your your? I'm going to ask everybody the biggest frustration or the one thing you wished had been easier or you received more help. Is there something you can narrow it to, Tara? Um, I, I referenced it earlier, but I think that the death of the Harold Greenberg Fund for English Canada is tremendously sad. Um, almost every feature film in Canada has, on the English side at least, has received support from them. And I look to the French system and see the level of support for development of feature films. Um, from all levels of talent. And I, I, I think I'm just so saddened by it. I will say the five films nominated this year, I do think it's, it is a watershed moment. These are incredibly diverse stories that have been nominated. And I think it's, it's a real testament to the changes our industry have, has gone through. I know we have a lot more work to do, but um, it's just one positive. I think it's, it's worth noting. Well, it is a big and broad question, and you know, I'm going to ask Shasha. But as a first film, and you said small budget, and and that's a, a program that's ever changing. I guess that you've experienced a, a way of making film that is that is not necessarily standard, let's say, or that is um, that had a lot of challenge already, <laughs> a lot of hurled, hurdles. Oh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to 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 ask everyone about the um, the biggest challenges the biggest. encountered or the, the 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 things that needs to be improved is the question the um the person watching just asked. But um, like just, you said, yeah. you, you experience you you experiment a, a way of making films through a a certain program that can be improved. Yeah, and I I think that actually um, one of the biggest a lot of the biggest uh issues I had with the program that we went through in 2018 um have now been addressed in the iteration thanks to much advocacy work done by organizations like REMC and Impact um but 
if just having a, a mentor or exec producer, I think would have been very helpful. Um, you know, we, we lost out a lot of community, right? Um, just running into someone and, and someone saying, hey, maybe you should think about getting a sales agent now that you're in this festival. You know, just like we share a lot of information um, when we run into one another. Um, and I think it would be help, would have been helpful to have someone kind of uh, making suggestions along the way. Yeah. And I think that that has been addressed in, in the newest, uh, the newest uh, iteration of this program. But being a first time producer for a feature film, Garrett, did you share that, that, that desire maybe to have mentorship in a way or another? Or did you have I, that? I've been so fortunate that I've had uh, a fantastic mentor in Damon De La Vera, who I met uh, at the CFC in the producer's lab. I kind of, my strategy, for going to the producer's lab was kind of to have Damon as a mentor and it worked out. Um, and, uh, and so I would not for sure have been able to navigate the business affairs needed for having all these different partners on this film um, without his experience. Um, we like closed the financing. And then because like you said earlier, we needed to, raise all this new financing for these COVID protocols. Um, he was instrumental in helping us uh, make connections with, uh, with folks who brought more money to the table. And our, our existing financiers also increased um, kind of their investment to, to cover those. But uh, no, I've, I've been extremely fortunate in that way to have Damon along for the entire experience. And he's a really uh, involved executive producer, um, creatively, financially. Um, so, so yeah, I feel very, very fortunate in that way. I think just to go to your other question though, of what can be improved, the biggest thing that needs to be improved is just uh, the theatrical Canadian value uh, formula, like how, how do how can we make these Canadian films? Um, how can we make Canadian audiences really excited about supporting Canadian films? And I know that's like a kind of existential question that I think uh, people have been asking for a long time. Um, but uh, it really needs to try to be answered because it's uh, it's you know super important to, to have that support and not to just have the support from the industry. Sometimes I think it's really easy to feel like, oh, your Canadian film is doing extremely well because you're hearing kind of it from the industry, but then that, that message is actually not going a broader into the smaller Canadian communities that really form the bulk of um, what Canadian audiences are, you know? Yeah, Nick, what, what should be improved? Well, I think it, we should have more diversified cinema in all aspects in front and behind the camera. And I think that, you know, it's been a stronghold of a minority producing films for over so long in the past. And, and that is slowly changing, but changing. And I think, uh, yeah, people want to see like when what I watch on TV and on streamer is more um, international content from the UK, from the US. And it's difficult for me to find the content that I can relate to in Canada, uh, whether in French or English. There are incredible stuff, but I think we need to do, the, the, the doors need to be more open. So there's more space and new stories that we've never heard uh, from people who had never had that opportunity. And um, yeah, I hope to see those, all those new, new voices more. Mm. You, you, you said many of your films were production with African countries, other countries. Uh, before Knights of King, you had Lemonade with a Romanian director. And right now you have releasing, I think this today in, in Montreal, uh, Twist à Bamako, Mali Twist by Robert Guédivian, but in Africa. Um, if you were to make a, a, a feature film in Montreal, in Canada, with no outside co-production, no outside funding, no outside input. Um, would it be frustrating for you? Would you miss 
those other funding, those other ways Honestly, of making films? I think that if I was the majority producer and that Philippe Lacote was a Quebec-based director, we'd probably be still struggling to get the financing together to go into production. Because it's it's too, it's not the typical script. It's uh, it's uh, there's ambition by the director and he loves. I don't know to translate that. He loves. He loves. He's daring. He, sorry? He's daring. He dares. Yeah, he's to... daring in his approach, in, the, in his storytelling. And, you know, we're all able to contribute to his vision. And, and to me, that's, it shows that it's possible. You don't need, 10 million dollars to do it you can do it with smaller budgets too and we have the talent in canada to tell genuine stories in new ways and with new eyes and but we must do away with the old way of doing things you know status quo and all that last chance to ask a question to my guests if you want to ask a question on the little q a a section of this app i have one question by neil haverty asking he's asking more about keeping getting things accomplished with the the pandemic that sometimes can be quite um it's been hard sometimes to work during the pandemic and and ask what keeps you grinding but i want to ask the question let's say more broadly no pandemic or no pandemic what keeps you going what keeps you working on films because you have great projects you look for funding you don't get it or you get it after after five six years of working on a film and then and then the film doesn't make a good box office and what keeps you going I guess it's the love of film, but still, what's the what's the carrot that keeps you going, Luc? Um, working on a working on a project for several years and and finally seeing it with a live audience and 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 feeling that the film connects with the audience uh, is just a unique feeling, you know, and it's a it's a I guess it's one of the differences between between uh, the different platforms and and seeing your film on the big screen with them with a live audience. You can you can feel even though your film is a drama or or you know, but you just feel the energy and the and the reaction in uh, in the theater and 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 a discussion following you know one of these screenings and seeing how people are touched by 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 your movie. Uh, and challenged, and, and it, 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 you know, sometimes it makes them, uh, it makes them, uh, uh, you know, change. Uh, it's it's just the, the reason why I keep making movies, and uh, uh, it's yeah, I guess it's just to, to to make, even though it may be in a small way, but change uh, change our world. Sasha, what keeps you going? Um, throughout lockdown, I, I mean, very much what Luke said, you know, when your film connects with the people that you made it for, um, that screening we had in Scarborough was everything. And, um, you know, we sat next to one of the little stars in the film and he lives in that neighborhood and that's where he goes to watch Marvel movies. And like, he had like a little running commentary, the entire film. It was wonderful. And that, that is like the perfect example of, you know, why we do what we do. Um, in terms of motivating you throughout lockdown or through the slog of, you know, the pandemic, I would say it was like my commitment to the writer, Catherine, my commitment to our crew and actors, they already put so much energy and work. So I owed it to them to, to do the, the best job I could, uh, I could do really as a producer. So, yeah. Tara? Well, I agree with Sasha that, that um, you know, the producer cannot crumble. All these people are looking to you and relying on you. And so you may privately go home and wring your hands, but you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other for the sake of all these people. But I think the question gets to the core of why we start the project in the first place. And that's why I think it's so important that you truly believe in the creative and the story because it is an incredibly long slog and it isn't easy. So that kernel, that little flame that you started at the beginning is, is what keeps you going. 
Garrett, even though you feel like you lost an organ to that film in the process. And that's a yeah, very normal, uh, that's a very normal feeling to uh, totally. be traumatized and, by the first film, but totally and, going. <laughs> and, and I'll just say that like, I wasn't breastfeeding while making my film. So it's all relative, right? The challenges are all that, you know, um, uh, all those things that Luke, Shasha, and Tara said, um, those are what keep me going as well. But when I think about um, if I ever do that, that thought of like, oh, maybe I don't want to do this anymore, or well, it's what else would I do? And um, and I, despite how uh, challenging the job can be, it's also so we're so fortunate um, in that the work is varied and it's um it's fulfilling and the, it gives you an opportunity to travel and work with interesting people who care about art and care about uh having conversations that can like luke said help to change the narrative of our society just a little bit for you know um for a time a moment or for you know forever and I think um, there is so much power in that. And I, whenever I, I that, that thought trickles into my head of, you know, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. I really just remind myself that um, it's actually one of the best jobs in the world. Last but not least, Yannick. Thank you. Well, I think the, the most powerful thing in the world since the beginning of time is storytelling. And uh, Night of the King is a story about the power of storytelling. And uh, I think that's my main motivation is to, it's such a, a privilege to be able to bring these stories to life and to share them with the world and try to bring different perspective on the world we live in, on the, in the country or around the, around the world. And um, I do believe in the power of, uh, of uh, film as a, as a strong medium, as a visual medium that can impact and um, it's just a matter of finding the right distribution the right uh, outlet so that people can see it and uh, yeah i strongly believe in that we can end with this um with this comment from lauren mckinley not a question but a comment all of these films are so extraordinary congratulations to each of you and thank you for bringing them to canada and i concur thank you all for being here today and thank you for those beautiful films good luck for the awards. Uh, so with me, uh, Garrett Patrick Pond, producer of Wildhood, Shasha Nakai, producer and co-director of Scarborough, Tara Woodbury, producer of Night Raiders, Luc Derry, producer of Drunken Birds, and Yannick Letourneau, co-producer of La Nuit des Rois, Night of Kings. Thank you so much all for being here. And Marab Gour Mercado, I give you the microphone. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank also um, in the name of the Academy. So Gareth, Luke, Shasha, Tara, Yannick and Claudia, of course, for today's conversation. And another thank you to our partners at the Canadian Media Producers Association for presenting the session today. Mm -hmm.